Good morning. Um, I am likewise delighted to have the opportunity to participate, seeing all of you, particularly having a chance to uh, celebrate uh, Bob's birthday and his many accomplishments. And as I was thinking about when Brian reached out and said, well, you know, would you like to give a talk? And I thought, wow, this is great. I could talk for an hour and a half about manganese oxide minerals. And, <laughs> and, and there would be nothing would please Bob more. I mean, what a perfect 80th birthday gift, right? You know? <laughs> but, but also during this past year, I, I have actually, I'm in the retirement transition process from the Smithsonian. And what it does, of course, is it makes you start to think back about uh, a lot of the things in your career. And as you start reflecting back, it's always the people that you worked with that first come to mind and that you realize were the really important and the really enjoyable parts of much of the work that you've done. And so even before this event has been announced, I was already in part of those reminiscences thinking about the times that Bob and I got to know each other and the many times we've intersected through my career and how critical the work that Bob has done, but Bob personally has been to much of what I've been able to accomplish and the people that I've worked with. And so this came along at a particularly good time, but one that uh, has been a little nostalgic for me. So my talk is gonna be a little more of a reminiscence of this a bit, a little bit of two manganese oxides thrown in, but uh, you know, this, is, this picks up in a way from after Tony Cheatham's uh, story because um, I started at Arizona State University as a graduate student in 1976. And so shortly after Bob had returned from Oxford and was now fully ensconced as a uh, new professor at Arizona State. And at the time, what attracted me there, partly I was I, you know, from Wisconsin. So the climate was a climate change was, was one thing, but they had a program where they were offering a, an opportunity as a graduate student to go into the joint chemistry and geology program. And many of the professors had joint appointments between the two departments. And so I went to work with Peter Busick, who had a joint appointment in geology and chemistry. And we had the option of going into chemistry or geology. And it turned out the stipend was higher for chemistry, so I chose <laughs> chemistry. <laughs> and, um, and so, of course, then you have to take some classes in the chemistry department as well. And so one of the classes that I took, in fact, 1977, was with Bob, um, X-ray crystallography, and Tony Cheatham was there and actually came in and taught part of the class. We got some neutron diffraction at the end of that class. And so the class that Tony mentioned is the one that I was in. And this was a one of these sort of transformational moments for me because I had gone to Arizona State to, I was attracted there partly because of the high, res, of the high resolution TM work that was being done there on minerals. It was a center for electron microscopy. And so I knew I was interested in mineral structures and crystallography but I was really kind of thinking more TDM. Yeah, well, then I took Bob's class. And one of the things you may know about Bob and is that in particular at that point, and I think still today, he has this just infectious enthusiasm for crystallography. And it was clear even then, <clears throat> Bob, <coughs> oh, pardon me. Bob loves, <clears throat> okay, glass of water, sip of water, thank you. That's your water. It's my water, good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. <clears throat> is that Bob has a great enthusiasm for crystallography, and that came through as his, as a teacher. He also was is a great teacher, and so I remember that class still extremely well as being just a really eye opening thing. I mean, his enthusiasm each day for what he was talking about, and one of the projects that he gave us to do was we each had to solve a crystal structure. And so he provided the data for us. And being a chemist, it was some organometallic that I could honestly care less about, except the whole process of refining a crystal structure. And at that time, of course, we're all familiar with what computers were like back then. It was the university mainframe, and you'd submit your job with a batch of cards, and then you'd wait till the next day overnight. You'd come back in the next morning and hope that you had a thick piece of paper waiting for you in your little cubby. And But the process of going through that seeing these Fourier maps coming out, assembling a structure, solving a structure, was absolutely just eye-opening and mesmerizing for me. And so I got excited about the idea of maybe doing this same thing for minerals, for things that I was interested in. And one of the groups of minerals that uh, my advisor at the time, uh, Peter, was interested in was manganese oxides. And in the 1970s, the 
ocean manganese project was a really big one. Um, and then um, interestingly, they you know, passed a ban on ocean mining. And so that sort of died down a bit. And now we're back to the same thing where there was this huge interest in ocean mining because of the critical minerals in these manganese nodules, manganese, cobalt, nickel, all those things. So at the time, I was thinking, well, okay, let's do the same thing I did with this organometallic thing, but let's do it with, um, with minerals. And so that summer, um, Bob introduced me to, so Arizona, this, I was telling Bob one of the problems that, that going back at that time, we're carrying cell phones around, so I don't have as many pictures from back then <laughs> as one we have these days. But um, one of the, th so I spent the summer with Bob um, helping me learn how to mount single crystals and some of you may remember that old piece of equipment called a precession camera, which seemed pretty darn cool to me at the time. And Bob was showing me how to mount crystals. And these were crystals that mostly he had around there. And I remember, you know, taking this little paintbrush and putting his mouth and licking it and then picking up a crystal and thinking, well, that's a pretty weird thing to do. But in any case, uh, we went through the summer and, you know, Bob was one of the things that, that you appreciated as graduate students. Mm -hmm. I was down in the lab. And, you know, not everything went perfectly all the time, right? You're learning. <laughs> and so you go up to Bob's office and you kind of put your head around the corner and he invariably was sitting at his, his desk, which was not so common for a lot of professors then. And you're never quite sure whether you're interrupting or not. And you kind of turn around, he kind of always wave you in. And then whatever it is you were working on, whatever the problem was, he just immediately gave you the attention that you needed to solve the problem and typically would give you a little bit of a hard time because you did something kind of stupid. But, you know, after a while, I learned not to take that too personally. That was just Bob being Bob, which is, but in the end, um, you know, procession work, and I feel badly. We've just gotten rid of a couple of procession cameras, the Smithsonian, I mean, literally just uh, surplus. I know they're going into the trash. And, but what an elegant way to picture reciprocal space. I mean, you know, it's just still a beautiful thing when you put together this set of photographs and you actually see three-dimensional reciprocal space and see everything going on. And, you know, it's still, I look at these and I just have these fond memories because the photographs you get are just beautiful. I mean, it's just an amazing way. That's a Lowry photo. What's that? I said, that's a Lowry photo. It, it is. I, I realize <laughs> that. But it's the only thing I can find quickly that have a bunch of spots on it. So I'm sort of... And, but you took those with the same kind of camera. You know, with, you know, and in fact, usually we started out taking them. But anyway, so it's a mineral barrel. but It's a mineral one too, by the way. So, okay. Yeah. So anyway... That got me pretty excited. It's like, okay, now we've worked on, you know, I think, you know, know how about single crystals. And so I started to talk to Bob about the kinds of minerals I wanted to work on. And so I went to Bob and, you know, okay, and said, okay, here are some of the minerals I'd like to work on, Bob. <laughs> and, uh, I remember, you know, showing him some of these manganese oxides, which you can see uh, not a lot of obvious single crystals there, but pretty darn interesting materials. And... One of, the, one of the expressions that Bob used to use a lot, I'm not sure if he does now, but I remember showing some of these to him and he just looked at me and went, yuck. <laughs> and, um, and so um, we, we started looking at a number of specimens. And interestingly, I got a couple of specimens from the Smithsonian collection at the time. And this was from a particular group of minerals, manganese oxides called Hollandite group minerals. And some of those interestingly had some little tiny crystals in them. And so, these seemed like promising places to start. So the first one we started with is a mineral called cryptomaline, a potassium manganese oxide. And I remember for it, so I said, I went back and looked at my lab notebook. I mounted up 38 crystals. And for the first 37, it was like Bob looking at the initial photographs going, yuck. And finally we got to 38 and there was one that we said, okay, let's try it. And you may remember, we actually, I did have a picture yeah, of oh, yes. the old single crystal <laughs> setup that we had there, um, a syntax, yeah. And you'll notice, notice the radiation shielding. Radiation, that's <laughs> right. But you also know this magnetic tape, state-of-the-art strip chart recorders, the whole thing. And I, my recollection, it took about almost a week to collect the data set for this particular crystal. Small data set. Small data set at the time, and it, it was. But we, in fact, got a good crystal structure. We got a refinement. And that then encouraged me a couple of other similar related minerals. We also were able to refine the structures. And so suddenly, I think a little bit to the chagrin of my advisor, Peter Busick, my dissertation suddenly divided into two, and a big part of it becoming the X-ray refraction work I was doing with Bob. Bob became one of my committee members and a person that I spent a lot of time working with when I was a student there. And 
the first paper that I ever published was one then with Bob and with Peter Busick on these holodyte phases. And um, so that's back 1982. And um, also, this is the first talk I ever gave at a meeting it was on this structure. It was at, I think, Spring AGU meeting in Toronto. And it turns out, just interestingly, that Dave Bish, who's in the audience, happened to be one of the few people, because it was late in the afternoon, the last day of the meeting, of course, and Dave Bish was one of the few people who was actually in the audience there. And I've got a slide here just for Dave, because Dave was really impressed with this talk, um, and particularly liked the fact that our R factors were really low, and we had a lot of significant figures. And so I remember he kind of asked me a question about that and went back to Bob and said, you know, there's some guy and I know, that was wondering about, you know, these R factors. And he said, he's just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we went on. Okay. So then, um, but in addition to working on crystal structures together, one of the things that Bob and I realized is that we have a similar interest in astronomy. And Arizona is a particularly great place for doing that because you've got these dark skies. And it was at a time when there was kind of this reinvigoration of and some new ideas for building your own telescopes. So Bob and I built our own telescopes. So Bob actually ground his own mirror, an eight-inch mirror, that he built a telescope. I don't know. Ten-inch telescope, a little bigger than Bob's. <laughs> inch, anyway. And... Um, but Bob was always a little bit envious of my color scheme on my telescope. His was just a white PVC tube. And, uh, but we would go up into the, uh, to the desert, up to Payson, about an hour, hour and a half north, uh, northeast of Arizona. And we would set up there off the side of the road, and we would spend many hours enjoying the beautiful Arizona skies. And so we had just a great time both doing crystallography, but also doing astronomy in Arizona. It was wonderful. Well, as you heard from Tony, if one of those, so Bob, then here we go. This is sort of a late 80s vintage, so a little, but Bob then eventually went to Los Alamos. But even when he was at Arizona State, he was traveling back and forth between Arizona and Los Alamos. And you go up summers, but also off and on other times. And on one of those trips, he invited me to go along with him. And so partly just to see what Los Alamos was all about, but also um, one of these samples that we worked on had iron and mang manganese, and so there was a sort of idea that maybe we could collect the neutron diffraction pattern and look to see if there was ordering with iron and mang manganese. So I took along a sample, and we got in the car and took this long drive up to Los Alamos. And it turned out to be a really interesting drive. Um, you may not be surprised if you know Bob. The whole time we did listen to opera in the car, and uh, mostly Gilbert and Sullivan, I remember. And but. Over all of that, we talked about crystallography pretty much the whole way. And much of it was his explaining what we'd be seeing in Los Alamos, whole neutron diffraction, powder neutron, you know, the work that he was doing. But we also got talking about applying this technique, we felt refinement, you know, looking at x-ray data. And I remember asking him all these questions like, you know, why, what's the problem? Why is it so much harder for doing x-ray data? And he was talking about peak shapes and profiles and all these things, the fittings, but clearly something that he was already thinking about. And it was obvious to me at this point that these manganese oxides I was kind of in love with, we pretty much plumbed the depths of the ones we're going to get good single crystals off of, and that pretty much anything else we're going to do after that was going to require some powder diffraction work. And in many cases, neutron diffraction, just because sample size and other issues, was going to be less likely of a, a direction. So there was this glimmer of hope that sort of came out of that drive that someday X-ray powder X-ray diffraction and applying some of these same methods that they were doing with neutrons could in fact open up a possibility to learn more about these manganese oxides. And so that was something that long drive came out of this. And so then we kind of went our separate ways. Um, I finished at Arizona State, went on, did a postdoc at Harvard, then went to the Smithsonian. And fortuitously, in a way, I went to do a postdoc at Harvard with the same person that previously were Dave Bishop. And so Dave and I, eventually connected and realized that we had both enjoyed working on really grungy minerals. He worked on mostly clay minerals, but was doing x-ray powder diffraction. And so he was interested also in the manganese oxides, bless his heart. So we started working together on uh, manganese oxides and other things, but doing powder x-ray diffraction. I would come out to Los Alamos and we'd collect data off Dave's instrument and we would try to do some refelt refinements. 
Well, lo and behold, Bob was there now at Los Alamos. And so that gave us an opportunity to consult with Bob on how we're, what we're doing. At that point, we're mostly using DBW, Ray Young's program, but the whole idea of rethought was something that now we really were trying to figure out what we could learn. And so even early on, so one of the things that, so these are the kinds of manganese oxides that uh, I was interested in, in working on. And partly because they're environmentally very proliferous to be, basically they, they occur in a wide variety of geologic settings, but mostly as coatings, you find them in soils, you know, out in Arizona, we saw those rock varnishes everywhere. And not the kinds of things that you can work on with single crystals. And so this is where the powder diffraction became um, a direction. Here's, these are biogenic manganese oxides from a coal mining site up in, in uh, Pennsylvania. See, again, very fine grain materials, coating were actually bacteria at one point. And, but really interesting materials. We'd like to know more about the structures, but also about their behaviors. And it turns out that part of the reason these manganese oxides are kind of interesting is that they occur in a wide variety of different structures. There are more than 35 known manganese oxide minerals. And mostly manganese plus four, but you get these manganese octahedra and they can form layer structures like the ones we have here. They can also form a wide variety. Just, these are a few examples of the different tunnel structures. The lower left, the holodites, those are the ones we'd be able to do the single crystal work on. But most of the rest of these, you know, totorokite, the lower right, one of the common minerals in manganese nodules, but also in a lot of natural settings, was a structure that was still mostly unknown. Now we knew at this point the structure was a framework structure because of some PEM work that Shirley Turner had done with Peter Busek at ASU. And so she had these images of the Todorokite structure that showed us it was a three by three tunnel structure. And so three octahedra by three octahedra. So basically we have this framework to begin with. And this is what Dave and I started with. And so we were able to collect powder diffraction data from some Todorokite samples. And then using, this is actually a synchrotron data set that we got at NSLS. And eventually from this, we were able to then do this partial structure solution, basically with the framework we had used, then collect difference or uh, calculate difference maps. And from those difference maps, locate water and cation positions so that we could basically fill out what the rest of the structure looked like. And so this became sort of our strategy for trying to understand the structures of these manganese oxides to start with what we know and then build on that using X-ray diffraction and uh, Riedfeld, and mostly by this point now using GSAS. And here's just a more GSAS2 version. Um, this is a more recent one that I did. It's a layer structure and showing with the spiffier graphics now in GSAS2, you can see the electrode density. Uh, this corresponds to an interlayer region in a layer structure, manganese oxide. And this is the, the <coughs> ultimate structure we have here. Turns out to be one of the most common manganese oxides occurring in natural settings, in, uh, um, particularly in freshwater sort of settings. And we went then from being interested in not only the structures of what these things are, but then really what we wanted to know is how do these minerals behave in natural systems? What kinds of reactions do they undergo? And so working with Peter Heaney at, at, Pennsylvania, at Penn State University and a lot of his students, we got involved in doing time-resolved X-ray fraction experiments at synchrotron, initially at NSLS, but eventually at the Advanced Photon Source. Curiously, there was Bob with the Advanced Photon Source. <laughs> And so we started collecting data, looking at reactions, how these various minerals would undergo different kinds of reactions. Here's one of the setups that we have at 13 BMC, where we're collecting X-ray diffraction data. We're doing a flow-through experiment. There's a small amount of a manganese oxide in a little capillary, and then we're capillary right there, and we're flowing a solution through that. And as that's happening, we're collecting X-ray diffraction data, literally following the reaction as it takes place. And we're also collecting extra absorption spectroscopy data at the same time, looking at changes in oxidation state. And so all of this data, you end up with, of course, huge numbers of fraction patterns. We are then analyzing using GSAS. And in this case, we're looking at the reduction of, uh, we're actually a reduction of manganese with the oxidation of chromium in natural systems with these layer structure manganese oxides. And this is work that was done by Phil Kong, one of the students of Peter Heaney at Penn State. And so basically as you're oxidizing um, the chromium, you're reducing some of the manganese, you're changing the structure of this layer structure manganese oxide from triclinic to hexagonal, you're adding some vacancies. Basically these are the kinds of reactions that we can now look at in great detail 
because of the tools that we have, Cyclotron and of course, GSAS. So just to show you, I'm not a one trick pony. I, I do look at other things besides manganese oxides. We stray into iron oxides once in a while <laughs> and, and there are a few other things, but there's one particular iron oxide that we found interesting, Akaganei it's called, and it's beta FeOH. Basically it's a major component of a lot of rust. You know, it's, and it's found in a lot of acid mine drainage sites. It's also turns out that it's, uh, it was a, it's a common uh, corrosion product for meteorites. And so this is one of the meteorites we had in the collection at the Smithsonian. And you can see all this rusty stuff on there. So we took an X-ray diffraction pattern. It turns out it was almost pure Akaganei. And so Akaganei is a holandite structure, this tunnel structure, but it has chlorine in the tunnels instead of cations. And half of the oxygens are replaced by hydroxyls. And so we were curious. So we actually did a refelt refinement with X-ray data and got a basic structure, the one here. So the green balls are the chlorine atoms. And then you've got iron plus three in the octahedral sites. But we were curious to know if we could put together more information about the hydrogen positions. Someone talked to Bob about doing a neutron diffraction. And we were not successful in being able to deuterate this material. It just didn't really work. And so we have all this hydrogen in here. And so Bob was at this point, it's still at, um, at uh, Los Alamos. And so he suggested, well, time of flight neutron data using a very tiny sample. So 100 milligrams of sample and as a way of sort of reducing the scattering from the hydrogen and allowing us to get usable data. And so this all sounded kind of interesting. I would never have thought of it. This was entirely Bob's idea. And so we collected, or he collected data there and uh, we actually got a pretty reasonable neutron, so neutron diffraction data that allowed us then to locate the hydrogen positions very nicely. And it just never even occurred to me that 100 milligrams of sample would allow us to uh, get a good neutron diffraction pattern and get this kind of information. And so then we now know that this, where the hydrogens are. And uh, <coughs> so another great example of a, a collaboration that would never have happened without, uh, without Bob. So I just wanted to finish off by saying, again, you know, you look back and again, there are, are not many people that have known you most of your research career. And in this case, Bob is one of the few that I can point to that from the time I started as a graduate student, I've known Bob and someone who has not only been a great mentor in terms of just crystallography and a lot of the projects that we've been able to work on and where I learned a lot of the crystallography I know today, but also a collaboration that turned into a friendship that as you can tell, the various places that I was working or went, Bob always sort of seemed to be there. But beyond that, he was always someone that, and I think you've probably, many of you have had this experience, whether it's GSAS or an interesting problem. You know, you send them an email, you call up and say, Bob, I got a problem. And there's a, something that's not working quite right in GSAS, or I can't understand why this is going. And you instantly get an answer. I mean, it was always, and it was all, not just you're bothering me, but here's your answer. It was, well, that's an interesting problem. Um, let's see if we can figure this out. Send me your file or send me your data, I'll look at it. And it always turned into a conversation there was always one that resulted in, okay, yeah, I'll fix that, or I'll, I'll add something new to GSAS, or no, you dummy, you just need to do this. But whatever it was, it resolved the problem. And this was a this support of not only, and I don't, you know, for me personally, I've, but I know how this has been the similar, the similar experience for many people. And the fact that Bob not only helped to write GSAS, working with Brian now continues to put GSAS out, but has supported it, not just technically, but supported it in a collegial and collaborative sort of way. And that is what part, a big part of what has made GSAS so useful to so many of us and has been so productive for so many of us. And I just wanted to pass out a greetings, Bob, from many of the students that I've worked with, with Peter Heaney. Peter's the again, professor at Penn State. And I've had the pleasure to work with many of his students over the years. We've collected synchrotron data, laboratory data, but all of these people here use primarily GSAS as one of their major tools in doing the research they did for their PhDs. And so when I was mentioning to many of them when I was going to be here today, they all said to put add on, you know, congratulations and a big thank you, Bob, for all the support that you provided to all these people all these years for, you know, in the work for GSAS. And many of them, they were afraid to call you. They'd say, can you call Bob and ask him? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I was the one that ended up calling Bob. Say, so here's what Bob says. And they're basically quiet. Anyway, so, 
So, Bob, again, thank you so much for a great opportunity to work together for the many enjoyable times we've had together. And, you know, every time anywhere I was, you see Bob, there's immediately an invitation to come to the house, have dinner. So getting to know his family, you know, thank you so much for the times that we were at your place. And so it's just been a wonderful collaboration. So again, when Ryan said he were doing a celebration for Bob, I couldn't think of anything more appropriate because he's impacted so many of us in so many different ways. And so Bob, thank you much. It's been a pleasure.